So teaching to identify plants and especially grasses can be very difficult uh, through a video. So I feel like these slides are going to be the next best thing in terms of an in-person uh, instruction and as far as some of the really identifying characteristics and some of the uh, control methods that we have to control some of these undesirable species. So we're going to go through slide by slide here, talk about some of the most common plants that we have to identify and control. Um, it's by no means the end all be all. There's many different species out there, especially depending upon where you are in the southeast or in the US for that matter. But we're going to discuss in these slides some of the most common that we see here in the southeastern United States. So one of the most important things to consider when identifying a plant is the anatomy of that species. So with plants, animals, insects, or otherwise, there's many different identifying characteristics and anatomical components that you'll have to familiarize yourself with. Uh, this makes identification a lot easier in the long run. It's nothing that comes overnight. It takes a little bit of study and in a practice. Uh, but when going over the anatomy, it, over time, it'll stick with you and you'll begin to really identify plants pretty quickly. Um, in the field uh, through just a field uh, manual or, or a, a key or whether you're sitting back down at the at the desk or uh, dining room table keying through some of those plants that you may not otherwise be able to identify right there on site. So some things as far as the stolons that these plants produce, um, rhizomes, uh, some of the root structures, the, the veins in the leaves, the color of the leaves. Um, a lot of times with grasses, you'll pay a lot of attention to the ligules, the collar, uh, the oracle structures, the sheath, um, things along those lines, and, and also the the inflorescence or the or the seed head and how that's how that's uh, uh, exhibited. So over time, this anatomy will come to you, but it, it does take practice and a little bit of uh, of know how in the long run, and, and you'll get better off. So we'll, we'll begin discussing the identification and control of undesirable cool season perennial grasses. And these are by far the most common that we begin with when talking about an old field renovation. And that's primarily because these cool season perennials outcompete the warm season grasses. It doesn't mean the warm season grasses aren't there. It's very important to scout for those as well. But most often we'll kill the cool season first and then begin to see the warm seasons after that. But we'll discuss them both here. Here in Northeast Alabama, I deal with a lot of tall fescue. Tall fescue is a very common forage variety. We see it widely spread in all types of areas, and it's, it's one that's very common to have to remove, just like we've uh, discussed in video one of this series at the Graham Farm and Nature Center. It was our main culprit in that old field mountain pasture. But you'll see that it's characterized by some glossy shiny leaves um, if you look at it from a distance you can kind of see a little bit of a sheen to those leaves not exactly dull or matted the seed head is what we can call a compressed panicle it has kind of that open uh, panicle structure but the seed itself is somewhat compressed at the end of those panicles around the collar there you'll see somewhat of a identifying characteristic and you know we term those white ears that are coming right around the leaf collar there and the leaves also have very prominent veins, uh, almost a little bit rough to the touch. And if you pull it up by the roots, you'll see that it has very short rhizomes compared to, compared to a lot of other uh, cool season grasses. Uh, that's an identifying characteristics. And in that bottom right picture, even though it does show somewhat of a bunching growth habit like that, which is something that we like to see with a lot of our native and, and beneficial vegetation, it, it is sod forming, which is a, a big reason why we'd like to uh, get this off the landscape. In addition, we don't see a lot of browse or uh, seed value for our wildlife. Next up is orchard grass. It has somewhat of a matte blue appearance. It really sticks out in fields where maybe it doesn't completely dominate. You can see almost these blue patches, and I've got a picture coming up that better visualizes that. But it has those uh, open panicles, almost a, a bushy uh, sort of a seed head, a little a round ball, if you will. The sheath on a orchard grass is very, very flattened out along the stem there, as you can see in that centered picture with, uh, with that really tall ligule. Uh, that, that again lays against the stem. So the, here that, that terminology really starts coming into play with sheath and ligule. Um, that's one of those things that you really have to key in on when identifying grasses. And if we dig down uh, closer towards the soil surface there at the roots, you'll see they show a very white stem compared to a lot of other grass species that we're dealing with. And if you would cross section those leaves, it will have somewhat of a V shape. 
Uh, those are all identifying characteristics for orchard grass. And here it is uh, clumped next to fescue. And you can see with the fescue there on the left, again, a little bit of that, that shiny leaf. You can almost see the ribs from the, that picture even next to that matte blue color on that orchard grass side by side. They can uh, they can really stick out and you can see the color of that orchard grass coming through. Very, very nice way to be able to identify that even from a distance. Uh, next up is brome grass. Now we have several variety of brome grasses that pop up all up, all throughout the southeast. These are some of the more common ones that we'll find um, in in Alabama. And again, they're not they're not overly common, but there are are areas where they do become um, quite invasive. Uh, and we do not need these on the landscape. There's there's no wildlife value that comes from these. So just going over some of these quickly, we've got smooth brome. Uh, it's characterized by leafy, smooth, and very narrow blades, as you can see there. In the upper central part of this slide, we've got soft brome and rescue grass, and we begin to really dis differentiate these from the seed head itself. Field brome there, the uh, lower picture, is also a very common one we see in Alabama, and perhaps even the most common is this cheat grass or downy brome. Uh, that seed head as it as it droops over and, and the hairs that come off the little spikelets there, those are very distinctive characteristics of uh, cheatgrass or, or downy brome. Perennial ryegrass is one that is very widespread, uh, very common forage for cattle and livestock. It's got somewhat shiny leaves in, in, in the bunches. You can, you can really begin to see some of that vibrant green vegetation and again it has a bit of a sheen to it as you walk throughout the field. Uh, and there's ways that we can very, very easily differentiate perennial ryegrass from annual ryegrass. We'll talk about annual annual ryegrass here in just a moment. Uh, but with our perennial ryegrass, they will have unclasped auricles, uh, whereas our perennial ryegrass, or I'm sorry, our annual ryegrass has a clasped oracle that begins to kind of reach around the stem there. Also, our perennial ryegrass has onless seed, where our uh, annual ryegrass is awned. Um, and on is a small little spike or, or hair-like structure that comes off the end of, of each and every seed produced. And you can see in this photo on the right, there are no uh, little spikes uh, coming off of the, or hairs coming off of those seed heads on this perennial ryegrass. So let's talk about some cool, or some of our undesirable cool season grass management uh, considerations and strategies. So for, for all of these species that we just overviewed, if the field has advanced growth, it's a good idea to get in there and mow or bush hog it a few times, or you can mow it and burn it uh, in the late summer and fall. And what we're doing uh, with this multiple mowing or this mowing and burning is we're really trying to get rid of the heavy thatch uh, that could otherwise interfere with our herbicide applications. Additionally, if we mow and, and uh, uh, multiple times or mow and burn, we're also promoting fresh growth and, and vegetation. That vibrant and, and fresh uh, uh, new growth does really well for taking on herbicides and getting a better control and, and kill of these undesirable cool season grasses. When we spray these, we're talking about two quarts of glyphosate. It's ideal if we spray these in the late fall and early winter after we've had a few frosts. That's when these cool season grasses again are up and bright green, vibrantly growing and going to be taking on this pesticide. Now after spraying, there's usually always going to be a, a thatch layer. It's a great idea to come back in and burn that off just prior to the native grass emergence in the spring. A lot of times that's in that May to April time frame, depending upon uh, the weather and, and your location in the southeast, but we're really just trying to get rid of that debris or that thatch blanket, if you will, so that we can spur on that native seed bed, make sure that it gets good sunlight, good soil moisture, and is able to grow as, as readily as possible. Know too that you know at the bottom of this slide, I've got that you can also burn uh, or, or mow and burn in late winter and then spray these cool season perennial grasses just prior to that native grass emergence in the spring. So again, you'd like to have that burn or that uh, spray uh, go on in, you know, that March, April, again, May, uh, Mar March and April timeframe, depending upon where you are in the state. Uh, so that's another option, but sometimes we don't quite get as good of a kill and control that way, which is why we'd, we'd much rather recommend that you go ahead and spray uh, in that late summer um, or I'm sorry, go ahead and spray in that early winter uh, time frame. There's a good visual of the thatch that can develop after spraying. Uh, this can be seen in video three. Feel free to join us for that as we talk about the prescribed fire equipment and site preparation. 
at the Graham Farm and Nature Center, once that fescue was uh, killed and controlled, uh, it was going to be pretty important to come back in and, and remove that. So we did that through a prescribed fire. You can see on the left-hand picture there, all that debris on the ground was, was certainly limiting sunlight and was going to stifle that native seed bank. So after the fire there on the right, you can see some bare soil. And certainly after the rain that followed, that little bit of ash and, uh, and duff that was on the surface there uh, was dissipated. So we had a nice, clean, open seed seed bank and, and site preparation for that native bank uh, of seed to hopefully respond. So that covers the undesirable cool season grasses. Now let's move on and talk about some of the undesirable warm season perennial grasses that we may see and that may require control on some of our early successional sites. Bermuda grass, this is, this is really um, one of the banes of uh, this early successional vegetation management. Um, it has uh, dark, narrow leaves, and, and the issue this is such a trouble is because of the deep and, and heavy rhizomes that Bermuda grass produces. Um, you see in that upper upper center picture there, uh, some of those rhizomes are, are, are an eighth to a, to a quarter inch. There's a lot of energy stored there. Bermuda grass is, is very capable of taking and handling a lot of pesticide, a lot of chemical. Um, so it's a very resilient plant that just has virtually no benefit or value towards the, the deer and turkey and, and other wildlife that we're trying to manage. It's one that we want to aggressively eradicate. It does produce by seed. It produces by rhizome and it produces by stolons or the runners. And a lot of times if you've been in a Bermuda grass lawn or hayfield, you've seen these runners moving along. It's just a very ag aggressive plant and able to reproduce in a lot of different ways. Um, the seed heads characterized by those three to five uh, slender, very fragile, delicate uh, spikes. But Bermuda grass is one that we want to get off the land. Okay. Next up is Dallas grass. Uh, it has rough, wide uh, uh, leaves um, with hairs that you find at the base as well. And if you look up this to the seed head, it comes up very often in these three to five uh, alternate alternating spikes, almost almost like a like a like a tree stand ladder going up um, one seed head on each uh, on each side of the uh, stem there, uh, alternating back and forth. It has a very tall ligule. You can see a very good example of that in that upper right photograph with, uh, again, hairs uh, that you'll see at the base and short rhizomes. Um, much like the tall fescue we described earlier, Dallas grass also has short rhizomes, but with this being a warm season grass, uh, pretty easy to differentiate between those two. Bahia grass, uh, very common uh, in South Alabama. We do see some here in Northeast Alabama as well, but not nearly as prominent as the mid to southern part of the state. Uh, fairly easy to identify uh, through the little V-shaped spikes uh, that that seed head will put up. Uh, very characteristic of Bahia grass. Sometimes you'll even see three on the end of there, but most often two. But it's this J-shaped purplish rhizome that really gives Bahia grass away. Uh, when you get down there and dig at the sod layer and, and begin to uproot Bahia grass, you'll find that purplish J-rooted rhizome and, and, and you'll know you have Bahia grass. It's very distinctive of that species. Vassy grass is another one that we do see uh, intermittently throughout the state here, in, at least in the northeastern area where I work. Uh, it does pop up every now and then, but that, ra that raceme uh, seed head there uh, as it comes up the stem and begins to put out the small little spikes of, of seeds in those groups of 12 to 15. That's very distinctive of, of vasty grass. It has a whitish mid vein and, and a very rough leaf. Um, and that extremely hairy ligule like you see there in the upper right corner. And the roots can be pretty fibrous as well. Not exactly easy to pull up uh, vasty grass, but if, it, if you do, you'll see um, some, some pretty... Uh, some pretty uh, strong and, and fibrous roots there. Next up is Johnson grass. <clears throat> it's another undesirable that you'll see pop up, especially becomes obvious later on in the season as it reaches that you know three, four to even you know six foot in height. Uh, you, it really sticks out in the field and it can be seen from a long ways away. It has that brown open panicle for a seed head, uh, that very distinctive white midrib, and that tall ligule. Uh, that you see there. Uh, Johnson grass is pretty distinctive, fairly easy to recognize, especially once it's mature. Like I said, you can see it from a long ways off in the field. So now let's talk about some of the considerations and control options that we have for some of these undesirable warm season grass species. 
So it's ideal to burn or mow in the wintertime. That's going to really help to reduce the heavy thatch. It's going to otherwise be there and interfere with herbicide contact. Uh, a lot of these plants that we're trying to control, these grasses, have very thin leaves and not a lot of surface area. So it's important that we get good contact. Um, so with a lot of the warm seasons you see listed here, Bermuda, Dallas grass, and Bahia, the Vassy grass and Johnson grass as well, it's important to allow this grass to grow and then spray it prior to flowering, ideally in that April to uh, May time frame. That young, actively growing vegetation that's getting good herbicide contact is going to control better than other uh, situations where you have more mature plants and where you have trouble contacting those leaves. But we'll start stepping through them here. So for Bermuda grass, it's really ideal that we go at it with a mazapir. Uh, Bermuda is a very tolerant plant and a mazapir does a nice job at getting uh, re really broad scale control on an otherwise headache of a grass here. So 24 ounces of a mazapir if you're using a four pound product or 48 ounces if your product only has two pounds of active ingredient is going to do well to control that Bermuda grass. Uh, now with Dallas grass, we've got uh, also Vassy grass and Johnson grass. It can be controlled with 12 ounces of a Mazapic or that three quarts of glyphosate. Bahia, a little different now, we can do two ounces of that Metzulfuron methyl, uh, commonly known as Escort. Uh, and also uh, the four to five quarts of glyphosate is also an option there. You just got to increase that rate a bit more than what you had for that early prescription with Dallas grass, Vassy grass, and Johnson grass. Bahia is much more tolerant. And with all these, a good surfactant is methylated seed oil. Uh, that does really well to help to contact and coat those small, fine leaves of these grasses. Now, it's important to consider, too, that if you're looking to spray after these plants have flowered, you're going to have to increase these uh, these chemical rates that I just uh, had, had mentioned to you. So once these plants have flowered, their tolerance really increases. And really, no matter what you do as far as spraying, you're going to have to do some follow-up treatments and do some surveillance. It's very easy to miss spots, and, and you'll certainly see that in the in the Graham Farm and Nature Center site that we have in, in a previous video where, where I did indeed miss some spots, and, and that, that just happens bouncing around some of these fields. You have to go back and do some touch-up later on. Of course, you've got a seed bank these plants are responding from, so you'll have just some natural um, production come back in from the, the prior year seed bank and just these carpet grasses are difficult to, to control and contact and, and like I mentioned with the Bermuda grass they can just be very resilient so they can take a lot of chemical so you want to be vigilant and spot spray uh, you can go back out with a one percent mix of a Mazapic or a Mazapir if it's a two pound product and then also a five percent glyphosate solution it, it depends on what you're trying to control as well we got to make sure we we identify what the problem grass is and spray it appropriately but that's what i'd done in the picture up there on in the upper right that was a patch of bermuda grass that had come back from a previous uh, mazapir spraying so i'd gone back out with that five percent glyphosate solution just spot spraying that small patch there and and actually probably should have just gone back with the Amazapic right off the bat. I did have to spray that patch several times throughout the summer uh, with that glyphosate solution, but it is now under control and we're looking to see what comes back next year. Um, and also we do have an option and somewhat of a, a pre-emergent application, uh, if you will, that if we know we've got some undesirables of crabgrass, Dallas grass, or goose grass, we can go back out with a 12 ounce uh, a Mazapic application just prior to that grass germinating and get some good control that way too, sort of a, a, a preventative, a pre-emergent control for those species. So just know that it really is going to depend on what species you're looking to control in terms of the, the warm season grass. And then we can give you uh, a, a good roadmap to follow in terms of being the most economical and, and efficient with your chemical selection and application. So we've identified and discussed control for some of the most common perennial grass species that we'll manage in Alabama. Now let's also talk about some annual species and some broadleafs that we'll look to control as well. So here we have an annual cool season grass, annual ryegrass. It's very similar to our perennial ryegrass that we discussed earlier, except the characteristics are, are pretty much just the opposite of what we talked about with the perennial. With this annual ryegrass, we see on the seed spikes there, the on seed uh, that we do not see with perennial ryegrass. 
We also have clasped oracles. You can see in that center picture where those oracles begin to wrap around the stem, very elongated. That's a great way to identify annual ryegrass. Uh, but just like perennial ryegrass, annual ryegrass has that dark, shiny leaf and smooth edges. Uh, but this is a very common forage grass. We see it a lot in food plot mixes, a lot planted for livestock uh, forage, and then also even for uh, soil stabilization and, and erosion control as well. Very widespread throughout the state. We do have some annual warm season grasses as well. I'd mentioned crabgrass just a moment ago, and then also goose grass. Um, sometimes these can be confused, especially uh, we see it a lot with lawn uh, uh, lawn managers, but um, we have to make sure we identify these as well in the in the warm seat or in the uh, uh, early successional management uh, that we're trying to uh, conduct here as well. So, crabgrass has a creeping growth. Um, it has very fine hairs, very very long stolons that that run across the surface of the of the ground there, and the seed head is three uh, very fine spikes, sometimes even more than three. Um, goosegrass, on the other hand, it lays very, very flat to the ground in what's known as a prostrate growth, and it's very whitish in the center. That's one very good way to identify goosegrass, and, and the stems are very, very flattened. Um, the seed heads aren't quite as identifiable between these two with uh, that goosegrass also putting up that, that two to six spikes, but you're really looking for that whitish, flattened stem. Here we'll switch away from grasses now. So here is a perennial warm season legume that gives us fits as wildlife managers, Sericia lespediza. Uh, this is one that is very commonly planted for erosion control uh, and was recommended years ago for uh, wildlife enhancement. Uh, it, was, it was hoped that quail would eat the seed and they certainly do, but the digestion, uh, uh, the digestibility for that seed just isn't there. So the benefit is, is very minimal for Lespedes and or Sericea lespedes in wildlife. There are other species of Lespedeza, but it's Sericea that we really are looking to control here. It's a very deep-rooted uh, plant. It will grow upright uh, with a very fine stem, and as it matures and later on in the season, you will see it lay over. But it's characterized by that little teardrop leaf, and when it's flowering, puts up these small little white uh, cream-colored, even a little bit a bit of a pinkish hue with a, a, a purple spot on the upper upper side of that flower uh, but this is one that can be very difficult to control and if you see it in your early successional areas or on your wildlife properties it's one to be very aggressive with some annual forbs that we may find to be an obstacle are thistles uh, those do very well to come back in and colonize disturbed areas if some surrounding uh, uh, lands have thistle or if they're already on the site you're looking to manage, uh, that's something to consider control for. They grow in what's known as a basal rosette, which you can see in the in that uh, that lower picture uh, below that flowering thistle. And that's a great time to control thistle when when they're in that young growing stage after they've bolted, like you see uh, in the left picture there, and, and put out a flower. Uh, by that time, it's very difficult to control that plant with chemical. Uh, the, really, the only options we have at that point are through severing the taproot with a with a hand shovel and, and actually removing that plant because those seeds uh, would mature and spread from that point on. Generally, thistles will have spine-tipped leaves and that, and that pinkish purplish flower, but there's several species. The most common we see uh, in my part of the state anyway is musk thistle. That's very typical for uh, Alabama in general, I believe. Uh, next up is dock. We're primarily looking at curly and broadleaf dock. That pictured there in the center is curly leaf. Uh, it is one that, that can become an issue, and you can see that you know when you have that much of an area uh, dominated in shade and, and reducing growth around it from those great big leaves that it puts out, um, you can imagine where a field full of dock can be can become a problem, and, and broadleaf is, is very similar uh, in, in form as well. But it also grows in a basal rosette before it bolts, like you see in that photo. Uh, and it has very shiny, waxy, broad leaves and, and really sticks out with that with that large leaf. Uh, it's one that you can see pretty easily. Uh, next up there, we have coffee weed. Also, folks will uh, call it sickle pot as well. It has a very compound uh, uh, pear-shaped leaf. Uh, it's one that will grow up in that in that three to five foot um uh, uh, height and, and again it will stick out fairly easy from uh, 
from from even a distance that the, those bright vibrant pear shaped leaves and as it matures and puts out the yellow flowers uh, very easy to see um, and if you crush that up or you're working around coffee weed you will smell somewhat of an old uh, an odor that somewhat resembles coffee anyway a perennial forb that we have to manage is some of these plantain species that being uh, buckhorn or broadleaf plantain when and black seed grows very similar to broadleaf uh, it also grows in a rosette like we've already mentioned for some other plants previously uh, but you'll see these very prominent veins on the leaves regardless of the plantain species and it sends up that dense and upright seed spike it's a very prolific plant that can really become an issue for some folks in some of the early successional areas that they have and, and even on on the food plot side of things as well so we've showed you some of the top offenders or management issues that we see pop up in some of these old field renovations uh, but it's important to know that we have options towards managing uh, the vegetation towards the species that we're trying to produce or, or attract uh, in this case for the presentation of for deer and turkeys we're talking about native grasses forbs and legumes with just about a 30 percent grass coverage that's where we really see the uh, most use in these sites when we keep that grass at a somewhat lower percentage so we have options uh, that's primarily through uh, herbicide or chemical control prescribed fire and also disking in some cases uh, so with these tools we're not talking about coming back in with any type of mowing that's not really much of an option for us here uh, and that's just because mowing is really going to promote undesirable non-natives it's going to allow a lot of the woody growth to re-sprout and, and really build up a lot of thatch that's going to greatly reduce the use especially for turkeys and, and upland birds you know it, that thatch at the ground level really reduces their mobility and really kind of causes somewhat of a, a predator sink and reduces their use of these old field sites so we don't like to see that thatch build up and also mowing you're out there destroying cover and structure and and mowing over rabbits deer fawns nesting turkeys or whatever else is used, used in the field at that time so we're not talking about mowing here um, but when it comes to chemical controls we can select those that are more uh, controlling uh, towards grasses uh, broad leaves and also woody growth for that matter now there are some of these that are listed on these species or these uh, these vegetation types such as the grass here we have a mazepic and glyphosate listed now a mazepic and glyphosate are selective uh, towards particular grass species but they're also going to kill some broad leaves as well um, so when we spray you know a field for multiple different issues uh, glyphosate is uh, is certainly an option because you're going to be able to control uh, multiple vegetation um, and species at, at one time but if you know you're going to go out and just primarily select for a certain grass variety we can be very selective in that option uh, also for controlling broadleaves you see a mazepic listed there as well but also very selective broadleaf uh, chemicals uh, that we have as, a, as an option to choose from at the same time so again we can pick the most economical and efficient uh, chemical for for whatever we're trying to control in the field uh, now for woody control we're not always just talking about a foliar or a you know over the top spray application we've got other options there as well known as hack and squirt cut stump and also basal bark applications where we can go out in the field and and really be effective at controlling uh, those uh, uh, woody growth that otherwise wasn't controlled for some of the other methods like uh, prescribed fire and speaking of fire uh, it's a fantastic tool and, and one that's really going to be um, uh, heavily relied upon in a lot of our uh, uh, situations here for old field uh, management uh, and really we're focused on the frequency timing and, and intensity of these fires as those are really what's going to dictate the response uh, of these uh, of the vegetation and, and of the site that we're trying to manage and we have ways with through fire we can promote broad leaves we can promote grasses and also control woody growth but a lot of times when we're out here uh, not only just trying to keep that 30 percent grass coverage but a lot of times our fire is going to be applied based on how much woody growth we're looking to have for the species that we're trying to manage you know particular to that site a lot of times when we talk about deer nest or i'm sorry deer fawning and, and holding cover that's that vegetation that's you know you're you're looking at that three to six year even six to nine year uh, interval to keep that really heavy woody growth so just go through some examples here when we want to talk about promoting broad leaves and this is this is a, a in general recommendation uh, lots of caveats go into fire uh, uh, applications but when we're looking at broad leaf promotion we're looking at late growing season burns and in longer intervals at that three to six years but like i mentioned you're going to get a little a little bit more woody growth uh, with that longer return interval we can promote broad leaves with more frequent one to two year fires um, 
but we're going to have to have some chemical control in there in terms of reducing the grass coverage to allow those broadleafs to flourish. We can promote grasses through frequent one to two year fires in the late dormant season. That's important is the, is the timing for that uh, promotion of grass. Woody control. Frequent one to two year burns do a nice job at controlling woody uh, growth as long as they're good high intensity growing season burns. We've got to have the temperature up high enough to essentially boil or girdle and top kill those uh, woody sprouts that we don't uh, or that we're trying to reduce coverage in the field. We can also come back in with a, a heavy disking at a one to four year interval and have some reduction that way as well. But like I mentioned too, we're going to have some patchy burns. A lot of times when you get woody growth in the field, you're going to see patchy burns as the fuel doesn't carry or we don't get the temperatures up where we need to. And you'll come back in with chemical control as well. So we don't necessarily just rely on fire or just rely on chemical. It's, it's generally going to be an ap application of both. And these two slides, the chemical and fire management, that's a whole another presentation in itself. I just want to touch on these to know that there are tools available towards maintaining and managing these early successional areas. And this is somewhat of a difficult presentation to give because there really is no one size fits all approach for old field renovation or, or maintenance in the long term. It's really going to be very site specific towards uh, your seed bank and, and well, your problem species you start with and, and growing conditions and things like that. It's going to vary quite a bit. So Usually killing out the existing problems is easy uh, because they're, they're generally going to be these cool season perennial carpet grasses that we've talked about here today, uh, but predicting what's going to come back or be uncovered isn't quite as easy. Um, sometimes what you get growing back on that site is what you want, very beneficial towards the species you're managing towards, but sometimes it isn't. Um, and certainly there can be patches of, of desirable vegetation and, and then pretty, you know, a little bit further on down the field, there's something else you need to spray or get rid of. And it could take several years and several sprains uh, for the site to develop and, and really be as beneficial as possible towards what you're managing towards. So we have to be able to, to come back in and ID those plants and spot spray them and, and hopefully enjoy it or at least learn to because you'll have to be doing a good bit of it. Um, if you can identify these plants when they're young, spray them out until something good comes back in its place is going to be uh, is going to be the, the way to success. Uh, herbicide and fire applications are, are available towards managing and, and teasing these areas back and forth. Just like we mentioned, we've got several options out there uh, for uh, molding and, and, and managing these areas towards the deer and turkey like we talked about today, but also other species game and non game as well. Um, so it's also important to you to know that the response on that site can change over time especially as we run several fires through there uh, the seed bank uh, can be exposed and, and the plant community can change so it's not necessarily that you get the site where you want to be um, and then walk away from it and just know that you can run a fire through there every few years and maintain it um, the site will change it's going to be dynamic and you'll have to be out there and and and, and walking through it every every season to make sure that it's uh, meeting the management goals that you have for that area so resources these are some some resources that are very good uh, on answering the questions of what is this is it good is it is it bad what do i keep what do i kill when do i spray it when do i burn it when do i disc it um, these are all questions that a wildlife manager is going to ask themselves and especially folks that manage food plots or early successional vegetation like we're here for today so it's these are all three good resources to brush up on plant id uh, and then also in that managing early successional plant communities for wildlife in the eastern U.S., that's a very good one for discussing control methods as well. So these are some resources that I find very valuable, and, and so do um, some of the other folks that I that I work with and and and, and help on a yearly basis. So please consider joining us as we continue on with this four-part series. Uh, in video four, we'll evaluate the response. So by video four, we're no longer discussing some of the management issues uh, in detail nearly as much as we are some of the beneficial species and some of the the quality response that we have um, from the site there at the Graham Farm and Nature Center. Essentially in that video four we spray, we wait, and then we go back and scout and, and visit the field and, and talk about the good and the bad that we see.